Why is addiction a disease that we have to understand? The main reason for this is 21 million people in the United States have the disease of addiction. 15 million of those suffer from an alcohol use disorder, and 3 million of those suffer from an opioid use disorder. An opioid use disorder is an addiction to things like painkillers and heroin. It's the number one cause of injury-related death in our country. The number one cause, more than car accidents and gun violence. In 2015, we had over 50,000 people die of overdose. 50,000 people of a preventable disease. The CDC even called this an epidemic. And so now what we have are people who have a disease that we can identify, that we can treat, but we're not. So how are we gonna stem the tide of this problem? Well, let's go back and start about thinking in a way that we can understand addiction from a human standpoint. So we need three things to survive. You need food, you need water, you need dopamine. Now, some of the people who get a little antsy say we also need oxygen, yes. Well, we also need skin, but I'm not gonna really talk about that today. We're gonna talk about the three things we absolutely need to survive as a human in today's world, and that is food, water, and dopamine. We need dopamine because it's the chemical responsible for motivation. It's this thing that's responsible for us going and making a friend, having a mother have a bond with a baby. It's the thing that motivates us when we do good to do better. When somebody pats you on the back and says, good job, and you go to do something more significant, that's because your dopamine has gotten pinged and it's just something pushing you, this invisible chemical that's pushing you along the path. On a normal day, we even know how much dopamine we're supposed to have. So on Monday morning, when I wake up and I have to get up and I go to work, I live in the range of about 50 nanograms per deciliter of dopamine. That sits in the central part of my brain and that's required for me to get out of bed and go get that first cup of coffee. Now, what about the worst day, the really bad day? The day you, you, know, you call your office and you fake vomit in the phone and you decide not to go in, you're like, I just can't make it. That's about 40 nanograms per deciliter. So not much lower, but low enough to where you just want to sit around in your pajamas all day and do nothing. What about the best day ever? You know, the day where all at once you win the lottery, you have 2% body fat, and you're living on the beach. All of those things happen at the exact same time. We even know that one. That's 100 nanograms per deciliter. Our brain is meant to go all the way to there. It's not really meant to go above. And we can look at things like your favorite food, which is like 94 nanograms per deciliter. And sex, 92 nanograms per deciliter. Bummer, right? Couldn't have predicted that. Maybe they need to redo that research. But at the same time, we know that we're supposed to live within this relative normal state between 40 on a horrible day and 100 on our best day. So what happens when we add a chemical into the brain like methamphetamine? This chemical is really important because it pushes us way past that 100 nanograms per deciliter. In fact, it actually pushes up to 1,100 nanograms per deciliter, more than 10 times the amount of dopamine that our brain should be making. And then if we look at things like marijuana or alcohol or heroin, these are things that push it up into the high hundreds. This is not what we're supposed to be doing. As we look at this, we have the normal that we're supposed to be. We have this large jump for something like methamphetamine. And then we have these other drugs that drive that dopamine up. And when that happens, it starts to take over that part of the brain. And no longer does going to your child's birthday make you happy. It's not happening. The things that normally make us feel happy start to pale in comparison. This is because the brain is built to survive. In fact, we know that this is a survival issue for the brain, mainly because dopamine is what drives us to procreate, to get food, to get water, like we talked about. And we know so much about addiction and all of these things that are going on in that part of the brain that we actually know the parts of the brain responsible for this motivation and this dopamine release. It's places like the anterior cingulate gyrus, the lateral bed nuclei of the amygdala, the the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, the periaqueductal gray. We know this. And by the end of all of these videos on this site, you're gonna know exactly what each of those parts do.
But for now, you should understand that this area of the brain called the limbic system, which includes, but it's not limited to, the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens are responsible for reward. And the fact that we can look on an MRI and see these parts of the brain working, and we can see them working in a patient who is not on any drugs, and those that have been on illicit substances for a long time, and see major differences in how these structures work, is really important because it allows us to start to understand things like behavior. We can see that all of the focus is on the dopamine part of the brain. Remember that nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area that we talked about? In that part of the brain, when you've been taking things like methamphetamine for a long time, every time that you take the methamphetamine, it goes from 1,100, then the next time maybe it's 900, then 600, then 500, then 200, then 100, then, you're required to take that drug even to get you up to that normal level of 50 nanograms per deciliter. Let's say we found this person, we get them into treatment and we remove that drug. Now we have people whose dopamine goes all the way down to as low as 10 nanograms per deciliter. And on their best day ever, it's only 20 nanograms per deciliter. These are numbers that matter and we're gonna keep hammering on these because when you have 10 nanograms per deciliter, you can't get out of bed. You can't get up to put your clothes on and go to a job interview or to even take care of yourself or your family. When we lack dopamine, the body craves it. And when you crave dopamine, you get into survival mode. And that leads to primal action. And that primal action is a lot of times the behavior that we see. How can they take grandma's jewelry? How can they steal a credit card? How can they pawn something that they owned? Their brain is telling them that they are not going to survive if they don't get dopamine. And the thing that gives them the dopamine that they need, as far as they know, is that drug of choice. Behavior is so much about how we define addiction that we even use it as the diagnosis. The DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual version five, which is what all psychiatrists use to help define mental health disorders, defines addiction not based on some lab test, not based on a urine drug screen, but very much bases it on the behaviors of a person. And we break it into really four major areas, four pillars, and there are 11 criteria in those four pillars. And when we look at it, you look at impaired control of use of the drug, meaning you can't really say no to the next one or even the first one. We look at other things like social impairment. How much does it really mess up the people around you and the interactions that you have with your parents or your friends or your spouse or people at work? And then we have risky use. Risky use means, do I know injecting this is gonna cause me to get an infection in my heart or could give me HIV or hepatitis C, but I'm still gonna use it? And then we have the pharmacological properties, which are really two out of the 11. So nine of these 11 have nothing to do with chemistry or labs or EKGs, it's purely based on the behavior of the person. It is unacceptable that we are removing patients out of primary care offices and any other place in the, in the healthcare system like a hospital or an emergency department when their behavior is bad because of addiction because that's how we define it. That is the diagnosis. So we should assume that behavior is a symptom and not a frustration. When we look at craving, which again is what drives a lot of this behavior, we actually have good data around craving and how that looks. So when we look at functional MRIs of the brain, my, this is a picture of the brain, and we can see areas light up, and these areas light up, you know, consistent with what part of the brain is working and how hard it's working. We had patients who were dehydrated, were in starvation mode, and had not received their drug of choice for a period of time. We had patients who hadn't had anything to drink for three days. That's a long time. And these are patients who are starting to get to the point of dehydration where it's going to be survival need for water and not just, I'm a little bit thirsty. So for these patients, we looked at a functional MRI, we put them in, in the tube in the MRI, and we would ask them questions like, tell me about a waterfall. We would play, you know, sounds of waterfalls in the background, and we would sprinkle water on their feet and take pictures of the brain. And we can look at these areas of the brain that are responsible for craving, like the anterior cingulate gyrus, the one we talked about earlier, and it would light up to about the relative size of a baseball. We did this for food. So we had patients who didn't get any physical food and, you know, per oral, meaning they didn't eat any food for five days. They would get some IV fluids and some vitamins because we don't want to kill people that we're trying to test. But at the same time, five days without food. And then we put them into the functional MRI 
We then talked to them about their favorite food. We then brought their favorite food into the MRI suite and we kind of wafted it into the MRI tube so they could smell it. And then we have them talk about how it would taste and then we had them taste it and spit it out. And through all of these, we looked at the brain through this functional MRI and in those same areas, instead of a baseball for dehydration, we had the size of about a basketball for uh, starvation. So we know what people will do when they're dying of thirst or they're dying of starvation. I mean, they will rob, they will steal. I mean, imagine if you walk through the desert and in three days time, you walk through the desert and you get to the end and all of a sudden there's this pedestal with a beautiful glass of water with condensation coming down the side. If it was me and I walked up to that and then somebody stepped in front of that glass of water and said, no, 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 this is, this is my water. I'd be like, oh, okay, stab. And I would move them out of the way and then I would take this water and I would drink that water immediately because that is survival. And people get in the, getting in the way of survival, they really put themselves at risk. And we know that and actually we'll kind of accept that. When people are looting stores when there's a famine or when people are doing what they can to survive for their children or to not die, we accept those things. What about an addiction? We took patients who hadn't had their drug of choice, and in these cases, for these studies, it was alcohol and opioids. And so when we took those patients and we put them in a, a functional MRI and we asked them a couple of basic questions. Tell me about the first time that you used your drug and the last time that you used your drug. That's all we really asked. That craving of just thinking about the drug lit that brain up. And it lit it up no matter if you were 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or one year. It was almost exactly the same. That craving signal in the brain did not decrease until two years. And what we found was the relative size of that craving was not a baseball or a basketball. It was a baseball field. So the craving for dopamine and that drug of choice so far outstretches the desire to not die from dehydration and starvation that it starts to make me understand why these behaviors happen so consistently among patients who have had the disease of addiction. So if dopamine is lacking in the nucleus accumbens, and this is the basis for driving this behavior, then augmentation of dopamine might make sense, right? If we raise dopamine back up to normal levels, then they won't feel craving and they won't be starving for the drug. That can then allow us to have an appropriate conversation with a patient, allow them to be engaged in treatment. So when we look at how we do that, we found that the two medications, at least for opioid use disorder that do this, are buprenorphine and methadone. By giving those medications, we actually can raise the dopamine back up to normal levels so that this person doesn't have to think about, I need my drug, I need my drug, because what they're really thinking is I need dopamine, I need dopamine, I need dopamine. And that starts in the morning from the second they wake up and it is there all day. Without this, we're not able to get patients stable enough to have therapy do anything for them. Because without dopamine in the brain, what you're not getting is even onboarding of emotional memory because it's required for that. And so when they go into therapy without having their dopamine in the right place, what they're hearing is rah, 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 rah. They're not getting anything from that. We have three major medications for opioids, and one of those is naltrexone, and naltrexone actually blocks opioids, so it doesn't necessarily increase dopamine. But for some people with a less severe substance use disorder or motivation, again, there's that term motivation. When we talk about motivation, I always want you to think dopamine. If you hear dopamine, I want you to think motivation. Motivation equals dopamine, dopamine equals motivation. So when we talk about, I really want a motivated patient or client to go get their therapy, we're talking about someone who has enough dopamine to have that motivation. Without it, they're not motivated. We talk about this in a number of different ways. We talk about it in stages of change. Are they pre-contemplative? You know, are they in the action phase? Do they want to come and do something positive for themselves? We use these really pejorative terms in addiction medicine, like, well, they need to hit rock bottom first. I don't think that's an option anymore, given that we had 50,000 people die last year of overdose because that's rock bottom for an opioid use disorder. But for those patients who have a lesser version of opioid use disorder, maybe something like an altrexone, which is a chemical that blocks this opioid, can be really helpful for them because they already have that intrinsic motivation.
They're already ready to, to move forward because they have this dopamine. We also have other parts of the brain like where alcohol works. It works on another part of the brain other than the opioid receptors. It works in the gamma aminobutyric acid receptors, right? These really specific receptors that they're the ones that make you feel super happy after one or two drinks and then not so super happy after four or five drinks. It's also the same part of the brain that drugs like benzodiazepines, which are like Ativan and Valium or diazepam, you know, these are things that uh, change that part of the brain. What about parts of the brain that are affected by marijuana? So marijuana releases uh, dopamine from the nucleus accumbens, and we found that we have a drug that actually blocks that extra release of dopamine. So for people with a marijuana use disorder, we even have medication that can change the way that that dopamine is released. So for certain drugs, it's all about dopamine. And for other drugs, it's indirectly about dopamine. But the final common pathway is dopamine. And whether you have the motivation to onboard therapy and the ability to stay retained in treatment. One of the other things to think about is the whole point of decreasing craving is what? Think about it. To keep the patient from relapsing. That's the whole point. Because if you have craving, you're more likely to go out and actually get a drug or take a drug or steal something to go get a drug. So how would we decrease that relapse? So there's some interesting research that's out there right now that talks about the more decisions we make in a day, the less likely we are to make a good decision later. This research that was originally done by parole boards, so they looked at the decision whether or not someone would be able to be let go from jail out on parole. And they took the parole board and they looked at the decisions they made in the morning when they were fresh, when they first started making decisions versus those decisions they made generally later in the day. And what they found that if your case was heard early in the morning, you were three times more likely to be let go as compared to being heard in the afternoon. Everything else was the same, the severity of crimes, the color of your skin, male or female, it didn't matter. What it came down to is there's a point at which your brain is done taking risk or doing something different. And for people who know that they can stabilize their dopamine, who know that they can feel normal, risk is saying no to that. The regular decision, the easiest decision is to say yes to that. So think about if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think of is, please don't let me use today. And the second immediate thing you think of is, how can I get my drug of choice? And then you have to say no to that. And then about every five seconds after that, over and over and over again, you're having to say no to that thought. And then if you're walking down the street and somebody comes up to you, you have to say no to that and you have to be in the right frame of mind. By the end of the day, if we haven't controlled craving in any other way, we're gonna have someone who has run out of the capability to make the decision that they wanna make. And their brain will chemically not be able to make the right decision. It is not like somebody draws a pros and cons sheet on the refrigerator and starts talking about the pros and cons of whether they're gonna go buy drugs today. This is not how it works. Decision fatigue is a huge player and what happens in the afternoon or evenings for these patients, because by the end of that day, they have said no 10,000 times. And that 10,000 and first time may be the time that they relapse. And so using medications and other therapies to significantly decrease craving is really important. We have treatments for opioid use disorder that are 75% effective. We have treatments for alcohol use disorder that are 65 to 70% effective. These are numbers that are better than any other disease. I mean, we have 75% rates for like strep throat with an antibiotic. There's still 25% that don't actually get better. But when you start looking at things like diabetes and hypertension, these are people who getting better looks at about 45 to 50%. We have this thing called the ASAM criteria, and this criteria has been validated and is used in almost every state in the country. Behavioral health interventions also have a long history of being really helpful for these populations. Anywhere from one-on-one -on -one therapy to group therapy to self-help therapy, these are all things that when applied to the right patient at the right time, absolutely can increase this. Medication-assisted treatment for all addictions that have medications should be thought of right out of the gates to help stabilize that craving so that the rest of these things can be helpful.
So when we look at opioid use disorder and we have methadone, which is 75% effective, buprenorphine, that's about 65% effective, now trexone, which is anywhere from 25 to 60% effective, and yet less than 10% of people even have access to these meds? That's amazing to me. Well, what about alcohol use disorder? Remember, we talked about 15 million people have an alcohol use disorder, and we have medications that have for a long time shown really effective treatment, and those are naltrexone, again, which for both of these, acamprosate, gabapentin, uh, disulfram, and even baclofen. These meds that we use all the time and feel very comfortable with can be used to help decrease that craving so that we can increase the likelihood that behavioral therapies will work. And then when we look at medication-assisted treatment for marijuana, we actually have a medication for that, N-acetylcysteine. This is a med that's benign in all other capacities, but can help to really get a patient successful without making it so tough for every single person that comes through. What about society? Like, is there an approach that we should be taking from a societal effort? Yeah. I think one, we have to start really taking a hard look at stigma. And in fact, I would reframe stigma and turn it into discrimination. Because we're at a point where if you come into the emergency department after an overdose and you're released 30 minutes after you arrive, as compared to someone who's had chest pain and gets admitted and gets all of these testing, that's discrimination, that's not stigma. And so we have to start understanding that we are not doing ethical things to these patients when they show up. Science is the basis for the approach that we need to take, not a belief. You can use your belief system and how you apply the evidence-based science. In fact, I think for patients, that's probably a better way to do it. But you can't use a belief system as the science. This is doing a great disservice to patients, and we have to start pulling those together in the way that it should be. In the criminal justice world, we have to stop criminalizing these patients for having a disease that we have a treatment for. We know that that behavior can be defined based on craving. We know that craving can be seen on a functional MRI. We know that it's greater than starvation and dehydration. And most importantly, we know we have treatments for this. So to take someone who has very obvious behaviors of addiction and put them in jail with no treatment doesn't make any sense. And when we start to look at how we prevent this disease, it has to be giving accurate, appropriate knowledge to the kids not telling them to just say no, not frying an egg in a pan and telling them that's what their brain looks like. Knowledge and education in the same sense that we would give anyone else. The thing that I need you to walk away with after this video is that addiction is a predictable, chronic brain disease, not a moral failing. It has treatments that are 60 to 75% effective. It has behavioral therapies that are well identified and we can apply on a regular basis, and that the fundamental funnel for all addictions is in this dopamine and reward axis. That part of the brain is responsible for motivation and ultimately survival. And if we can use the science to affect survival in these patients, then we will absolutely come out ahead.